starting a new painting today, and uh, even though it's drawn out and uh, fairly definite in subject, I'm uh, again, like the last painting, kind of ad living and improvising as I go. So uh, I did this much, drew it uh, on there, and took, went and did something. Uh, while I was away, I thought, oh, you know, I should do this in oil. I haven't done an oil painting in a while, so um, that's an example of changing your mind as you go. Here's some more progress. I uh, used acrylics to do a sort of underpainting, just enough to hold everything together. And I might add that this uh, painting is based on a very, very rough, rough. Is there a dog in here? So yeah, I've been making some rather radical changes in the studio lately. Part of it is these big box lights that I have now, uh, off to the right here. I have two of them, and it's for video production, but also I've found that it makes a huge difference in the clarity of the paintings. So basically now my understanding is that if you do a painting under, say, a piece of paper, I mean at the light you got zero to 100% brightness. So if you're, um, so you're indoors at night, you're working, you got some light bulbs, at the best you have maybe fluorescent work lamps or something like that. Where are you on this? Um, you might think that, you know, 60%. Oh, that's a good, you know, it seems comfortable, it seems okay. Well, okay, paint your painting at 60% and then take it outside into 100% light. All of a sudden, everything gets washed out. So what'll happen when you do a painting at 100% uh, brightness when you're working, if you take it into 60%, it'll look dark, as it should which is why, for example, museums are well-lit uh, places. The displays are well-lit. Uh, they need to be because the paintings um, exist in best in pure, uh, pure light. So anyway, um, also uh, another thought is that um, I had been painting um, with a lot of the acrylic stuff with just a drop cloth, a plastic sheet underneath. And it's like, you know what? Seeing these colors in the periphery um, affect your color judgments. So I remember very well going to uh, N.C. Wyeth's uh, studio in, where is it? Pennsylvania or something. And it's still there. And he um, is painted the entire studio gray. Uh, and the reason being was to... Um, not interfere with the color judgments of the picture. So if, for example, you're working on this and you have a color strategy of something versus something, say, and um, you got this color over here, well, it's not invisible. It's competing. So I was looking around for something rather neutral, and I don't have anything gray, but I have these big Home Depot boxes that I... Uh, used for shipping paintings and I can cut a panel from that and hopefully it's big enough yes yeah, it's pretty big. Turn this and so uh, I can work on here and it's, uh, it's kind of like a table and it won't be too um, too uh, too interfering anyway looking at the painting again um, I'm at a stage now where I need to decide what the painting is going to be about. And I don't mean being about a witch. Uh, that's the subject. But as I talk about in one of these YouTube videos, a painting needs to be about light value or color. And so you have to decide which it is. So this painting could go either way. Uh, light value or color. If it went toward value, the colors would be downplayed, the lighting would be downplayed, and it would be a contrast of the very dark robes of the witch, and then perhaps the, the descending values of uh, things going into the distance and so on. And so your appreciation of it would come, hopefully, from that. Now, if it were about light, then uh, the light effects would be dominant, and that could be a light on her. It could be the light of the moon in this. Uh, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, make it moonlighty. I'm 
it seems to be appealing. And then the other way to do it would be with color. And um, in that case, I could see an orange versus blue um, color scheme. And um, uh, orange versus blue, they, they could be treated as bright. You could have bright orange moon and um, blue or purple sky. But you could all you could have them bright, but then you could also use the same color scheme to do a uh, value-based uh, picture or a light-based picture. So they all work together. But anyway, it's going to be orange versus blue or blue purple um, with some value with the black. Um, and you know, at the moment, I like the idea of the light on her because either she's going to be decision has to make, be made. Is she going to be brighter than this? How's that going to relate to that? And so on. So uh, paintings, good paintings have four main uh, values. So that's something that could be plotted out, uh, figured out in advance too. And you see how, um, what kind of thought processors, uh, processes, processors are involved in this kind of thing. Um, these various rules and axioms that I, that I know I've uh, learned from here and there and I Boom, 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 use them quickly, figure it out. So anyway, what do you think it should be? That should be lighter than that, or that should be lighter than that? Could be dramatic either way. If she's a silhouette against a bright moon, it'll give one effect. If she's lit, then that will tend to recede more. So anyway, not definite on that. I'm gonna throw some paint down and figure it out as I go. It's been a long time since I did an oil painting, and um, let's pull those out. Now just as a little aside here, uh, these are some paints that I use. Uh, this is what's called Golden Open Acrylics, and it's a special kind of acrylic that stays workable for a long time. And you know, you can do uh, oil-like work with these. Um, they're quite incredible, but uh, I find the colors to be not quite as vibrant as they could be. And, um, harder to uh, put on thick. The thicker you put them on, it, it does take really a good bit of time. It can take a good bit of time to dry. So instead I'll be using these, and they are by, what's the company? I think it's the Swedish thing or something. Um, Holbein, not the Hollanders, whatever they are. And these are oil paints, and they are actually water soluble. You can use water with them. It's a new formulation. Well, I don't know how new it is, but, um, Boy, you don't have to put up with the toxic fumes of the, the uh, turpentine, which is a killer. Um, if you don't have open windows or you know it's winter outside or something like that, you can make yourself sick as hell, kill yourself, ruin your health. It's just not worth it. A lot of the paints are toxic enough the way it is without adding in that stuff. telephone conversation. I kind of lost a little inertia there, but I did get this ready. This is what I use for pallets, cardboard with some foil, tape it on there. Um, what I'm going to do with the oils is I will uh, mix some batches, uh, and I usually know how to make enough um, so that I get, wind up being able to cover everything I need to and not have to um, not run out and try to match colors and things like that. You know, looking at this, uh, there's some, compositionally some things going on here that um, you might find interesting, uh, even though they are, at this point, well, I wouldn't say accidental, but they're so uh, intuitive that um, it's just the way things turn out. And what I'm talking about is compositionally uh, lines running through the thing. So with a picture plane like this one, um, the lines that you can draw, you can draw diagonals from the center here, center here, center to corner, center to corner, center to center to center to center, 
center to corner, bomb bomb like that, like this. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with anything? But um, be when your space is limited, your picture area is limited, then everything is relative to the edges. Uh, you don't want the eye going to the edges, for example. You notice I steer away from that, try to bring things in, things coming in. Uh, also, when it comes to jiving with these lines, it's like now, when I drew this staff, um, is more or less not thinking compositionally per se, not in terms of these lines, the, the grid as I call it. But you'll notice that from here to here, it pretty much follows it, very, very close. Of course, it doesn't have to be exact. So, and also lines like this, like so. She's falling into that. Bats falling in, coming down like this. Uh, over like so, hits the mat, the moon and the bats and so on. So that's all real dry, I know. It's kind of the skeleton and the under structure that supports paintings. And um, people generally aren't aware of it, but of course classicist, uh, classicism, uh, they knew all about those, these compositional things and I uh, use them all the time. Well, I have to get a little sidetracked yesterday by that phone call and uh, here we are the next day in the morning, uh, getting ready to get cracking on this thing. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm using these uh, Duo Aqua Oil Colors by Holbein, which are water soluble uh, oils. And these are the colors I'm gonna start with. I'm using a blue versus orange uh, color scheme. I decided that, uh, well, I don't have orange, oddly enough. I need to get to uh, you tracked online and order a tube of that, but uh, in the meantime, I'll mix an orange. I'm using vermilion yellow ochre, ultramarine deep, which uh, I've decided to go with the night scene. Um, other blues that you have, cobalt is, is good for daylight skies and things like that. Uh, actually, I think I might use the ultramarine light instead. Uh, burnt sienna, it's kind of an autumny, you know, um, brown orange and burnt umber uh, dark brown for dark parts and hopefully with mixtures of these i'll be able to put down a good bit of stuff i will um i've decided to use the approach of not light not make the painting about light or color but to make it about value i decided that to have a spotlight on her would be unrealistic there wouldn't be a light like that out in the in the cornfields and uh, having the light behind her, it just it's not the painting's not about not about the moon. So um, it's going to be value. There will be elements of color, will be elements of light, but they won't dominate. So um, here we go. We'll get as much paint down as we can, and uh, then allow it to dry, and that will be stage one. You might find this interesting, uh, how I lay out these colors. Some artists have the same colors laid out in the palette for every painting that they do, and I don't do that. I customize each one for each painting, uh, kind of knowing what order I'm gonna be working in, and somewhat, and um, what sort of combinations I wanna make. So up here, this is gonna be a kind of a neutral color for the sky, a lot of blue. Um, adding some opposite of blue to uh, knock it back a little bit, which would be a sort of orange, which I'm using this uh, burnt sienna and yellow ochre. Uh, more yellow ochre for the uh, cornfield colors. Uh, darks where I need them. Um, raw burnt sienna for the oranges and a mixing area to mix the oranges. Um, don't mix apples and oranges. And I also, if I want to go um, get a darker color than this umber, then I will pull out some um, ultramarine deep and mix it with the brown. Okay, throwing down some sky color here. It looks a bit darker than I originally intended, but uh, there again, I'm able to judge the uh, value really well because of the good lighting that I have here. So uh, it is a night sky, and you know, um, in a way, the darkness is kind of good. There's a lot of streaky, uh, streakiness going on here. Uh, but um, that can be smoothed out, and um, 
the value can be lightened here on any of this stuff uh, a bit easily by wiping it and allowing some of the canvas to come through. So this rag, see I'm wiping in color. It's uh, blending everything, removing brush strokes, and uh, getting things evened out a bit. Then again, do I want to even out everything? You just kind of have to boldly go into the unknown. Um, okay, that's pretty good. Um, I have a blending fan brush around here somewhere. I don't know if this, I don't think this paint is really applied thickly enough for that to work very well. There we go. So I'll work this a little more and come back. You know, as a kind of interesting side note here with technique, um, painting courses about light and dark, and when you want to lighten something in an oil painting, um, you can add white, but um, the more white you add, white is uh, probably the slowest drying color. So you're going to delay your, um, prolong your drying time, and delay completion of your painting, the more white that you use. And so that is the um, advantage of using a rag to wipe out things. So um, here, for example, there's the, you can see that, that's using my fingernail. You can use uh, the end of the brush, like so. Doink, doink, doink. Oop, ran out of camera memory there. Um, so where was I? Oh yeah. Um, so for Zeta paintings, you can see a good bit of this where, um, he used rag, uh, used a rag to pull paint off to create lighter areas by letting the can uh, canvas come through. And uh, it would seem kind of counterintuitive. A lot of people just want to pile paint on and they think that's what the painting is. So to put on paint and then remove the paint to, for the effect um, seems counterintuitive, but sure works. So why not? So here we go, it's coming along pretty well. There's a lot of paint on the canvas. Um, the water-based oils have a uh, slightly different consistency and they can add, seem to behave a little bit like watercolor here and there if it's puddling and there's a lot of water involved, but that's okay. And um, one thing, the thing I was saying about colors sometimes being rel relative to what's next to them is funny because um, I had intended to use um, burnt sienna for, excuse me, for the oranges, but um, burnt umber um, appears pretty, to be pretty close to orange uh, when it's put down here in um, relation to all the blue. And of course, blue would make it look more orange. Uh, another color, red, would make it look more red. Um, here's some spots where I'm digging in there with the brush handle wrapped in the rag. Um, so I'm going to keep working it. Well, here we are maybe about an hour in, and it's a lot of fun. Things are kind of falling together. One thing I realized is um, there's a rule about uh, color that... Uh, if the highlights are cool, the shadows are warm. Or if the highlights are warm, then the shadows are cool. So in this case, um, we're going to say that the moon is casting a cool light, which of course it would be. That sort of necessitates that the shadows be warm. But then again, the shadows that are warm in this painting might appear to be cool in another painting relative to the color scheme. So, um, it's interesting working with these paints. I haven't done oil in a while, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Hey, we're back again. It's uh, the next day. 24 hours have passed, more or less, and um, yesterday I stuck the painting out in the sun, uh, direct sunlight to help it dry for about five, six hours, maybe something like that. So uh, even this, all this paint is very, very thin, and of course, 
uh, when you paint, typically you're going thin to thick. So uh, this is the thin application, and we're going to throw more paint on today, thicken things up. And uh, so let's get uh, started on that. didn't know you could blow dry oil paint well uh, thinking about what I'm doing here because uh, the sort of neutral color that I mixed is a bit murky um, when you begin mixing colors if you mix uh, when you mix browns in um, they're not a precise color so the effect they have on things like blue it makes them go kind of murky and that's kind of good uh, when you want something neutral because painting thin to thick when the background's thin like this and you want um, The later layers that are thicker to come forward then it's really good to have not necessarily gray, but neutral uh, colored background so other things going on here, so what I did and um, Something new this painting um, I, I'm realizing that it's like that mix of brown and blue. That's good for some things but uh, one axiom of painting that a lot of people use is not to overmix colors. So they usually say never mix more than three together. Um, if you're mixing four colors together, there may not be a, a real reason to do that. But then again, rules are meant to be broken. So if you have a situation where you've got one mixture that's made, made out of three colors and then another mixture that's made out of two colors, oh, the universe will explode if you combine those on your on your painting and of course it won't and there are a lot of times when it's like you will be combining or blending mixtures and so you may be combining five eight colors six whatever so anyway um, on this one at this point I've decided to do something uh, that I've never really done before and that is to try to only mix at maximum two colors together to do anything that I need to do on this picture so the first thing I did was like, well, I've already got some blue going and I'm painting cool to warm. So uh, what I'll do is I'll make a purple and I will mix in a very nice pure red, this one, which um, is, it's not cadmium, it's uh, the other one, uh, vermilion, which is closer to yellow than it is to uh, purple. But um, so anyway, mix that purple. And I took a brush, which is basically a pretty cheap Walmart uh, art brush, which uh, I use these for watercolor. I wouldn't say it's a watercolor brush per se, because you can use it for anything. But I use this to apply that purple in a lot of places um, very thinly, basically like watercolor, like washes. And um, then I blow dried it, right? So uh, put some on here show you the darkening effect here so he goes on wet looks a little darker because it's wet probably what is this on the end of the pole hmm well if there's a story there maybe it's a bag full of um, various witchy things like chewed off fingertips or something like that okay let's try this let's put a little bit of this mixture I'm running out a bit here I think up here on his bat Darken the bat, make it stand out a little bit. You know, I'm thinking about doing a uh, moratorium on bats. I have so many. I use them for, uh, you know, compositional purposes. So, you know, what else are you going to stick up here, you know? I mean, bird, branches, butterfly. I mean, what would be up there in the air? As I talked about the uh, compositional grid that I often use or that's basically subliminal uh, unconscious I use it unconsciously mainly in my work it's like oh line from here to here it's like it's these bats follow um, those lines they're locked in there into the grid so anyway you can see what's happened with the uh, putting that purple over things there's purple over the blue and because it's warmer than the blue now wherever I put it things are starting to come forward and uh, ultimately what's going to happen with this painting when the colors are in Probably the last thing that I'll do is I will go in and I will put in some pretty dark black. I will actually use black paint and I will use it on the figure uh, to really darken things. And when that happens, it should really pop. What you'll find with the picture 
is that while you're looking at, oh, it may look fine, all the values look fine, but then again, they're all relative. So if you put in a block of black, then all of a sudden it changes everything big time, increases the, uh, the uh, contrast. So. Hey now, here we are with a mixture of uh, a mixed orange where I use the vermilion and uh, yellow ochre. Of course, I could have used a brighter yellow, you know, and uh, but I don't want the orange to be super bright. So anyway, the orange came out looking pretty darn orange, even though it's yellow ochre, which looks like that, not a bright yellow. And uh, also, um, these paints work so well when you mix them with water. Um, you can do. I'm finding I can do all kinds of things. So I took that orange and I. Um, used it uh, over the bluish stuff on her to create a flesh tone. And you know, I don't think it looks too bad. And I also moved around and I put the orange in different places at different uh, intensities or thicknesses. There's orange here. Uh, there's orange over here, 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 over here, little spots here and there. Now the other thing, you may be wondering, what's this shit and what's that crap? Well, that's basically the um, stalks of wheat or whatever it is and those will mainly be done last uh, where the strokes of paint that indicate the leaves or whatever they are will be placed over everything they'll go down last basically so um, that's where we are reached a kind of interesting point here I uh, was talking about painting the grass and I said I'd be doing that last but I got to get that yellow in there so I did start painting grass Probably I will uh, have some highlights on the grass and what I've done here actually won't be as uh, obvious because the highlights will tend to tend to dominate. Um, and the yellow, um, because I used ochre and blue, again mixing only two colors, uh, it looks rather green here, but uh, you might, if you looked at it, you might say it was green or have a hard time determining exactly what you would call it. But on here, it looks pretty yellow. And of course, again, that's in uh, comparison to everything else. And another point, uh, while I've got it at this stage, is that the yellow, just as I took the orange and traveled around and put that in different places, I also took the yellow and put that in different places. I put it on her and the, on the flesh in different areas. And um, the, um, the way yellow works on flesh is that yellow tends to be, there's more yellow where bone is nearer the surface. So that's a good uh, bit of knowledge for you painter guys out there to use. So it would be, um, you know, breast bones, corners of the eyes, around, also around the nose, uh, places like that. Another interesting, uh, another interesting little trick is that I've used raw burnt umber, plain burnt umber out of the tube to go into some shadows and remember early on I decided that uh, I was going to have warm shadows so uh, I put that umber into the shadows you know it's a very warm brown and um, it seems to work against against especially against the warm uh, orange pumpkin color you'll be real surprised to see what color highlights are going to go on those pumpkins Got so involved here, I forgot all about the camera. But uh, you see, I got a lot of done, a lot of stuff done. Uh, moving around temperatures, uh, values, and stuff like crazy. Um, the highlight mixture is blue and white, so it's cool highlights, and they're all over the place. So yeah, at this phase, we're just moving around the painting. Um, fine-tuning things, basically anything that can uh, increase the form, look more dimensional, look rounder, uh, create contrast, um, temperature relationships, value stuff. Um, you know, you just, you, you see things that you feel you can fix and make better. So you throw it down. Look, here's a bluish highlight on this leaf here. Not too much. Not too bad. Serves a purpose, kind of 
creates an eye path. Uh, the eye goes from highlight to highlight, actually. Um, does not travel around in shadows. And that's borne out by the fact that all that work that you saw in the early stages, all the stuff up here, and it's like you would look at that and you would see, oh, it's rough, it's da da da, you know. It's like once the contrast and the temperatures are in there, it's like you don't, you, you don't, um, you don't notice any of that stuff. And, uh, you know, years ago when the Comics Journal tried to do a hatchet job on Frazetta, and the guy they got to do that, well, he didn't do a very good job because he, uh, they said, oh, the backgrounds of Rosetta's paintings are full of meaningless brush strokes. And basically, yeah, well, they're meaningless because you're not supposed to be looking there, you know. I mean, I don't want you looking here. So I essentially don't put anything there. I don't put a bunch of modeling on clouds and stuff. But some people feel, oh, I got to do that, you know. And uh, when you have a painting like that where all the detail is... Um, the same everywhere, same level of detail, you get frickin' chaos, but um, people, you do see it, you see it being done, and uh, here's a little moonlight coming over the hat, that makes the hat a little more three-dimensional too, so um, how about this, see this little collar, I already lightened it a little bit, but I'll put a thing on there where it's like, oh, light is blasting down there from that moon now. That creates something too. Now we can, I'm going to pretend that the uh, shoulder here is in shadow from the hat, so I'm not going to monkey with that. But, um, you know, I think we're ready for the darkest mixture, the black. So I'm going to whip that up and throw it down. Well, there you go. I just about. Um, getting close to being done, I suppose. And uh, you can see there's all kinds of tweakings that have been going on. Uh, the black's been put into place. That makes a big difference. Um, we're at the stage of the endless correcting, endless tweaking. But I guess I asked for it, didn't I? So, you know, people want oil paintings and stuff. They don't realize what goes into it, not to do it the right way. Constant thinking, constant um, decision making on a very high level. It's kind of like working math problems all day long, something like that. So, see, so here's something. I'm not happy with this hard edge here, for example. And that's what Frazetta said, you know, it's, it's, Controlling the edges, tweaking the edges, making things flow properly into each other. So this, we're kind of at the end, and I'm going to um, end the video. Um, there will probably be a more, an even more tweaked version of this, you know, probably tomorrow or whenever. Um, but we can save that for, uh, for making a print of it or something like that if you want to. Get up close and personal to see all the tweakage. So thank you so much for watching and um, hope to see you again.